Welcome back everybody to another Python tutorial. We are on part five of our series of k-means clustering. So taking a universe of stocks and clustering them in Python. So in our last video, we kind of did, I would say more of our graphing, our PCA analysis. So that was just getting a visual overview of the data and then also performing a PCA analysis. So basically that is a dimensionality reduction tactic. Um, the whole idea behind that is there might be redundancies in the data and basically we want to explain as much of the story with as little data as possible because there are efficiency gains from that. So now that we've done our kind of visual component, we've done our kind of first analysis, why don't we build our model? And so that's what we're going to do next in this video. We're going to build the model for both the PCA data set and then the regular data set. Now, again, just as a reminder, with three attribute PCA analysis really doesn't make sense, but the idea is to kind of set the stage for later videos where we do move to a more higher dimensional uh, data set. So that's just a little bit of a reminder that again, while the PCA data set is here, don't take a lot of weight on it. This is more for demonstration purposes. All right, so first things first, we're gonna import some libraries from sklearn. So we're gonna say from sklearn dot cluster import k means so we're going to be using the k means algorithm that should be kind of obvious up to this point and then we're going to import our metrics we're going to have to evaluate some of our clusters and how well they are clustered and we're going to see different uh, kind of tactics we can use to determine the number of k's that we need so the number of clusters so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna define a result dictionary. Um, this is again more for just transportation purposes. We might not necessarily be leveraging it, but I'm assuming some people are gonna want an easy way for, to basically get some of the information that they need from their particular data sets. And so this is just a nice way of storing that information. So create a dictionary to store our scores. <clears throat> and then, so this will just be called results dictionary equals an empty dictionary. And then we need to define the number of clusters. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually try multiple clusters. And the reason why is we're gonna actually talk about something called a silhouette score. This is a way of determining how well, well, it's kind of a way of determining how well we've created our clusters. I have a definition up here. I think this does a really good job of explaining it. Um, so basically the idea behind silhouette analysis is it can be used to study the separation distance between the resulting clusters. Um, we're gonna see that there's actually a chart we can create that will also kind of help drive home this concept. But the idea behind this particular measure is that it can range between negative one and one. If it's positive one, it means that the samples are far away. We have very distinct clusters, very separate from each other. Visually, it will make sense when I show you the chart, but um, ideally we want plus one. We want to get as close to positive one as possible. Um, for a value of zero, we kind of get this opposite. So they're very close together. And so kind of decision boundaries can lay on top of each other. And negative one is basically, it's just kind of this glob of information. It's, I mean, it, if it's negative one, there's really just no structure there. It's, it's not really good. And so just keep that in mind. Ideally, we wanna get as close to one as possible. It doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna reach it. Um, I will kind of talk about the ranges of, you know, whether there's actually structure there or if it's just kind of like, well, it might be there, it might not be there. We can't really draw any strong conclusions. So that's just kind of setting the stage for really looking at our, our model and asking the question, you know, how well did it deform or perform? So define the number of iterations we want to do. In this case, we're gonna say number of clusters is equal to 10. So we're gonna do 10 iterations. So run through each K, each K. And so we're gonna say 4K in range. We're gonna start at two because again, we don't wanna have one cluster that really doesn't make sense. <laughs> we wanna start at two. Um, and so we're gonna do our clusters. And then I want just a nice little way to distinguish each one. I don't want an entire glob of information, ideally. So we're just gonna do a little line. Um, we're gonna also define uh, the key for this particular iteration. So define the key for this iteration. This is gonna be used for the dictionary. So we're gonna say results dictionary, and then we're gonna do K. 
So this is like for, you know, for the uh, iteration of two. And then again, that's gonna equal another dictionary because this is where we're gonna put each score and each score is gonna have basically its own key. So we gotta create an instance of the model. K means model. And so we're gonna say K means equals capital K means we're gonna define the number of clusters well, that's just K in this example. So how many clusters do we think? And then also a random state. This is more for reproducibility. So again, if you were to ever come back and say, hey, you know, how did you get those results? We can define a random state and we can just call that and we're good to go. And then the nice thing, again, this is the beauty of SKLearn. We just pass through our X train robust data set. And then from here, it's going to fit it to the model. Okay, from here, we now need to grab our silhouette score. So we're going to define our silhouette, and I always hate spelling this word because I almost always misspell it, but I don't think I did it this time. Maybe I did, who knows. So we're gonna store that in a variable called sil score. It's gonna belong to our metrics module. And then inside of that, there is a silhouette score. And what we can do with this one is we pass through our data set. So the robust data set, and then we're gonna take the result of the k-mean. So we're gonna take the labels, and that's the underscore at the end, and then we're gonna define the metric we wanna to use to kind of compute the silhouette score. In this case, Euclidean is usually um, our go-to one. You can use other metrics, but again, they kind of all are used in their own specific purposes. At this point, let's just stick with Euclidean. Again, when the time comes, we'll discuss other options. From here, <clears throat> sorry, let's store the different metrics. So store the different metrics. So this is a way where, again, you have a nice way of getting all the information that you need. I'm just gonna copy this one just to make it a little bit quicker. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do silhouette score. Kind of proud of myself. Usually I screw this one up a lot. Okay, so that's gonna be a silhouette score. <laughs> And I'm going to copy this a couple of times because there's different pieces of information that we might want from this. Um, for example, there's another score called inertia. Inertia. And then there is the score itself. And then sometimes what I like to do is I like to just put the model in there. Again, if you just want to say, hey, let me just kind of grab, you know, that particular iteration. Here you go. You've got an instance of it. And then we got K means score. So that's the actual score of the model. And then we've got K means inertia. Okay, perfect. And then from here, we need to print out some of the results. So print out the results. And we're going to say print the number of clusters. And it's going to be that. And we're going to do dot format. And then that's just gonna obviously be K and then print the silhouette score. Silhouette, I, you would think, and this is just me speaking, you would think that somehow <laughs> I would not have this memorized by now, but apparently not. And we're gonna again do format and then we're gonna do our silhouette score just like that. Okay, so let's run it through and see what we get. Oh, da -da 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 -da. Did I misspell it? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is an underscore at the end, my apologies. Okay, <clears throat> so you can kind of see right here as we kind of actually have fewer clusters, we actually have a better silhouette score, but that's just part of the story. Don't necessarily jump to conclusions with this. 47, it's not great, but it's not horrible either, in fact, I mean, 54 is, it's okay. It's not really a strong, you know, distinct cluster. I will say that. It's not something I would go like, oh yeah, let's get all super excited about it. But it's also not like, well, it's super horrible and it, there's just nothing there. Basically, these two scores would really kind of be saying is there might be something there. There might not be something there. It, it might be artificial, basically. Once you start getting down to 30, it's really, it's kind of hard to sit there and say there's kind of any structure there. But this is really the first component of it. There's a couple more things that we're gonna have to look at in order to really say what is the num optimal number of clusters. Again, it's not just this simple little, hey, you pass it through and you just take the highest score. I've seen that done sometimes and it can be 
it can kind of get you into trouble or you might be necessarily, you might be missing something. So um, it'll, again, it will make sense when we actually um, create some of our visuals. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna just take our PCA data set and just see what we kind of get with that. Um, hopefully we maybe get a better score. It's not guaranteed, but we can take a look and see what happens. But exactly the same steps. This is again just for us. Okay, so we get a little bit of a better score. In fact, as we get higher clusters, our score tends to stay relatively well, where up here it was dropping, I would say a little bit faster, but nothing crazy. Again, it's kind of this weird component where it's like, well, there might be something there, there might not be. I would maybe be exploring different attributes and just seeing if there's anything better. I've seen other results where, you know what, this is more than enough. You know, again, it's gonna kind of depend on the domain that you're in. But the idea behind this is it's still exactly the same steps. We're just now applying it to, um, I would say, the, the PCA data set. Okay, so now that we've done that, another kind of step we should take is actually visualize these silhouette scores because that's going to kind of help us again determine what the optimal amount of clusters would be and this is also kind of one of the challenges of k means is we have to determine k it's not going to tell us what k is there are methods out there that we can use but they don't work that great sometimes and so this is where this challenge comes in with k means it's not always a clear-cut answer as to what the optimal number of K is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a silhouette graph. Um, this is gonna leverage the yellow brick library that I mentioned, I think in like the first video. You do have to install this. This is not a default in Anaconda, but it actually is a nice little graphing library. I actually found some pretty interesting ones that I thought would be, hey, this is kind of nice. Um, and then there's also something on scikit-learn that you can use as well if you wanted to. So really at this point, I just want to see two and three. I really want to see how does two and three look inside of our clusters. So I'm going to define clusters as a list. And then again, I'm just going to put each individual cluster. I mean, I could technically run through them again, but I, again, had the luxury of doing it already. And I'm going to tell you right now, none of these ones are gonna be kind of that optimal. Four maybe, but that's kind of pushing it to be honest. So we're gonna say four cluster in clusters, and then we're basically gonna do what we did up above. And so I'm just gonna copy this little guy right here because that's exactly what we need. And then I'm just gonna change K to cluster. It's still gonna be, um, what is it? Well, technically we don't need this at the end either. It's still gonna be everything else is the same, but we're gonna kind of see that it's just broken out in a couple of different steps. So what we do is we pass the model through the, the visualizer. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new variable called visualizer, and then that's gonna equal our silhouette visualizer. And from here, then we just pass through our k-means model. So it does all the stuff in the back for us. The sklearn one is definitely, I would say, more complicated. You have to do a lot more yourself. This one, it does it all for you. It kind of just takes that model and it does all the complicated calculations behind the scenes for you and then come, pops out this very nice, um, pretty graph. You know, and who doesn't like an easy way of doing things, right? Well, I guess some people enjoy the challenge. Show the chart. And so they have this interesting way um, you call the visualizer variable and then you call the poof method. It's an interesting choice, but um, I know I misspelled it. I had to visualizer. There we go. Okay. I'm going to zoom out just a tiny bit temporarily. Okay. So what are you looking for? Ideally, you want each one of these little groups to be above the red line, that's the average. And so if it's below average, that would be what we would consider suboptimal. So the first thing is we want each group to be above this red line. And then ideally, we would want each group to be relatively the same width. So this one you can clearly tell zero is basically taking up majority of a cluster. Where this one, it's a little better, it's still not great, but it's better than this one. So right now my gut is kind of saying, maybe I should be looking at three clusters. 
Um, it's still not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And unfortunately, this is kind of just the reality of the data sometimes. We might not always get a super clean cut like, oh, it's very obvious. Sometimes it is a judgment call that you have to make. You might be curious why some of these are negative and some of them are positive. Uh, these are kind of the outliers in a sense. The negative ones are the outliers. These are the ones that kind of lie in between two decision boundaries. And again, when we do an actual plot of it, it'll make a little bit more sense. But at this point, just understand that these are what we would call the uh, the outliers in a sense, because they do, um, they kind of lie in between two decision regions. Okay, so with this one, um, we're going to just now pass in our PCA data set because, you know, hey, we've done it with both now. So let's just keep up the thing. Okay, and so here you can notice it's it's changed pretty significantly. In fact, I would maybe even say this is a little bit better than, than this one. Um, it's interesting, though, how this one now zero is still the large one, but it's kind of the roles were reversed here. It's, it's almost like it flip-flopped a little bit. So that is kind of interesting, but you know there could be many reasons why that is the case. So this is doing a silhouette analysis. This is again helping us to determine what the optimal number of clusters we should potentially be choosing. I'm still gonna go with three because kind of my gut's telling me, you know, I think three is a good one. Um, you could explore doing more clusters and see and see what happens, but. Again, ideally what you want is each one of these little kind of groups to be above the red line and ideally kind of the same width. You don't want any of these to kind of, you know, dominate the other ones because basically what you're saying is the majority of your data exists in one cluster. Again, sometimes that is the case. That might just be the data. But ideally when you have multiple clusters, you want kind of a more, I would say, distributed uh, grouping ideally. So with that being said, that does conclude this video. So if you have any questions about the silhouette analysis or actually building the model, please put them down in the comments below. And you know, as always, I'll try to get back to you. And then in our next video, we're gonna actually create um, our scatter plots again, but now we're gonna be doing it with the labels. It should be a relatively quick um, video because for the most part, a lot of it's kind of identical. But what we're gonna see is we have to add some different components to our scatter plots in order to um, uh, what is it? Uh, create the items that we need to create. So thanks again for watching, everybody. We're going to see you in that next video.